have trickled in, we usually wait three or four before we start. Yeah. All right, we've got 15 people, that's good. Friday is a better day than Thursday. Yeah. I've got Andrew Garecki is here, Chris is here, Guillaume, Henri, Storyteller, Jan Pilgenroder, Pilgenroder, is that right, Conrad? Christina Massan, Wojciech, Theo. Are you Theo Senior, I think? All right, the usual process is just to wait a little, a few moments just to, for the last people to trickle in. Yeah, there's a couple more to come in. Krishov, welcome. Mas Masij, Machij, Machij. We're still waiting one of our speakers. It doesn't look like he's in the room yet. Oh, okay, so I can do that, yeah, I can add select a panelist. Yep. All right, I got you, Theo. All right, let's get started. So, um, this is potentially a little bit underprepared, but hey, nothing like ad-libbing, hey? All right, so welcome everybody to Meteor Impact, um, a talk from a group of um, random people. <laughs> I'll explain how that works in a minute. Um, and the title of the talk is Abstractions on Top of Uniforms, although as you'll probably see, there's very little talk about uniforms. It's more sort of uniforms is under the bonnet. It's a bit like, you know, the, the uh, Italian car that's got a Ferrari motor in it, but I'm not interested in the Ferrari motor. I'm interested in this beautiful bodywork that I've built. Just kidding. The uniform stuff is important. Anyway, so let's get started. Um, how do I do this? All right, so introductions. Um, I am the and I've, I struggle for this word, founder, CEO, president. I'm something of back to bikes. You know, when it, it's a it's a not-for-profit bicycle enterprise, we recycle bicycles. So the concept of CEO doesn't really fit for it. So some people call me founder, but I find that a bit weird. So I still don't know what I am. Anyway, um, as we grow, we create more money and we've got need for systems. So given that I'm in IT, I started looking around for people to help me write code. I figured, you know, open source students will get them in and have a go. 
Um, so basically back to dev, back to dot dev is a domain that we own. And the idea is this, this will become a something of its own at some point. We're gradually building expertise. People are sticking around, they're interested, it's community-based, it's open source. So that's kind of a little open source organization with a with a heart that's that's evolving. All right. So our mission is to write cool code, build good stuff, help the community, train people, all those kinds of things, you know, in a very sort of a casual way, but a, a but a sort of directionful way as well. So we do have a bit of a purpose. And Theo has been helping me to evolve that. I, <laughs> I sort of know what I want, and he's helped me to bring it up to the top and be able to talk about it. So thanks for that, Theo. Um, so in the team tonight, we have Andrew Gorecki. I, I might just, um, let me get the panelists for a minute. I'm gonna promote Andrew to speaker and he can at least say hello. So Andrew Gorecki um, was with us for a while during lockdown, um, the extended Australian Victorian lockdown. Um, he's since got a job and now he's, he's working super hard and he's tired at the end of this week. Um, would you like to say hello, Andrew? Hey, sorry, um, it, my audio cut out when I when you added me, but hi. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and Andrew worked on the, um, on the framework for the text mode editor and the previewer and done a good job on that. All right, so Theo or Theophilo Sarua is um, from Brazil. In fact, let me, you introduce yourself. You do that. That's probably the best way. Okay, I think Theo is easier. Let's, let's not get complicated. I think every, um, um, my name is Theo, then call me Theo. I'm from Brazil and I, a little bit different from the other guys in the sense that I'm a little bit less technical, a little bit fresher in the IT area, but I have a business background and I've been helping Mike and everyone else get a sense of direction and objective for the project. All right, and then Tim, it actually lives in Sydney. You wanna say a few words about yourself, Tim? Hi everyone, yeah, my name is Tim and I started work about three or four months with Back to Bikes, um, just to essentially help out the community. Never really participated in any kind of charity kind of um, organization before. So it's good to give back from time to time. Uh, my role is basically front end dev. So I've been doing front end dev for about, I'd say two, three years. So still fairly new. I'm still trying to grow my expertise and knowledge in the area and um, just trying to help out where I can. All right, and then Min Kwang. Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Min Kwang and uh, I'm from Vietnam. Um, I'm actually a senior student when I joined um, Back to Buys, same time with the uh, team, Andrew and Teal. And uh, at first, uh, I want to learn the experience, but I stick around because of the good work. And, um, and uh, Mike promised to throw awesome barbecue parties. So that's one more reason to stick around, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, just hoping to... Uh, contribute and uh, grow back to bites. Thanks. Okay, cool. And then for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike King. I'm the, the founder of Back to Bikes. I also have a full-time job. So um, I don't have much time in between those two things. And I also volunteer as a, as a lifesaver. Um, and I like to ride my bike and go kayaking as much as I can in between. All right, so let's move on with the show. Um, so what is it? What are we doing here? We're building a forms app. That's probably a, a simple way to describe it. And why? Why are we doing it? Well, we want to do better because it can be done better. Like what's out there isn't that great. 
And then how? Oh, a bunch of students. That's a great idea, isn't it? <laughs> and that may seem a bit crazy, but it's actually worked out really well. Like these guys have just come together with different skills and, um, you know, just done a really good job. So I'm very happy with that. All right, so what's the motivation? Um, forms on the web are kind of painful to code. You know, it's hard work. Everybody codes them differently. They take a long time to write. And, you know, it's like, if you have to do 50 or 100 forms, it gets pretty darn tedious to do. So, you know, and it ends up being expensive as well. So your, your boss says, well, you know, how come all these forms, they're just simple forms. Why did they take so long? Like, yeah, good question. All right. So around at what's out there in the marketplace, the job form and type form are probably the standouts. Um, they're quite pretty and they're functional. They do a reasonable job. I'd say type form is prettier than job form. Job form sort of verges on the ugly side, but it's got a lot of features. Um, the thing is though, that if you want to use them in your custom application, it gets ugly because they're really kind of, they don't really want to integrate. You, you end up with iframes and, you know, the data formats are kind of hokey and then they change the data structures on you without any warning. And then, you know, your application breaks because the data's in a different format. It was in JSON and then it's in something else. So, you know, it ends up being a pretty ordinary experience to try and use that. And there's a lot of really sort of very basic form tools that they sell as plugins to WordPress sites and so on, which are really not worth thinking about. Right. So getting into the code, which is the normal way of doing things, Formic is a, is a pretty good library, and I used that for a while, quite liked it. Um, used Autoform as well in the Blaze days. Um, there's other things like React Forms. There's a thing called UI React JSON Schema, and there's a UI React semantic JSON schema as well, which is similar based on the same thing. And then of course there's, there's uniforms and uniforms is kind of my current favorite in the, uh, in the forms universe, as it were. Um, let's go on and, and have a look at those offerings. Um, the, the challenge is that they start with the data schema. So they're sort of data centric. They say, Here's some rules that define your data. And one approach with it is to say, well, you've got a schema for the data and you've got a separate schema for the UI. So you say, well, this one's going to be a radio. This one's going to be a checkbox. This is one going to be a pull down. All of those kinds of rules are separate from the schema. That works quite well because you can then really control what the UI looks like. But the problem is that you've got to maintain these two things in step. And when things get complicated, it gets kind of hard to manage that stuff. So it's, it's not an ideal situation. Um, the other approach is to do UI extensions to the data schema. So you kind of hack some stuff in there where you might have a little word that says widget or for uniforms, you've got a uniforms keyword and you can put some things in there. Um, the problem with that is, you know, it, it's kind of clumsy. It's obscure and sort of non-intuitive and it ends up getting complicated. In order to do particular things, you've got to kind of code like this and then you hold this over there and that there. and You can make it work, but it's not an easy experience. Um, and then there's challenges like, you know, things like checkboxes. How do you deal with that? How do you control... Um, and particularly with something like checkboxes, like with radio buttons, you've got your allowed values. So you say your allowed values are A, B, C, and D, and then that displays the radio buttons or it'll do a drop-down list. So that's kind of okay. You can choose between those two things. But the checkboxes get complicated because you go, well, I've got 10 checkboxes, but I want the customer to select three and only three of them. And uniforms or any of those tools, well, some of them do, it depends on, on which flavor, but it becomes a little bit difficult to do that, to count them because they're actually implemented as separate data points in your schema. So therefore you've got no ability to group them and to, to actually count the number of checkboxes. Um, so as your UI gets a bit more complicated, then it gets 
progressively harder to to manage those kinds of things. So that's kind of the the background for the the why we're doing this stuff. Um, so let's move on to okay. There's a lot of issues. One is good this way. One's good that way. You know, nothing's perfect. So what would the ideal solution look like? And I came up with this list, and it's like it's got to be easy to use. It's got to be easy enough for a a business user who's a who's a non IT, not a developer, doesn't want to write code. He wants he or she wants to be able to create forms. You know. Let's say we have a text mode which allows them to cut and paste from another one and, and post, put stuff in. And then there's some kind of compiler that can turn that into the runtime. A GUI mode is going to be useful because not everybody wants to work in text mode. And in fact, very quickly, if you've got a GUI editor, nobody bothers with the text mode. And we need sort of online edit and preview capabilities. Um, and then as things get more complicated, we need the simplicity of a, of a simple tool, but we need the ability to extend it. And this is where things like Typeform and Jotform fall down that you can't really go the next level. Like you can't build custom components in them easily. You know, it can be done in a way. Um, but what I'd like to see is a world where you can say, well, I want to drop a React component into this. And you can already do that with uniforms. Um, but what I'm imagining is, a, is another level of world above that. All right, so what I'm going to do is switch over next. Who was going next? Was it you, Theo? Yeah, I've got a little bit of yep. the- Have space. you got anything to present or are you just gonna um, show the app? I'll show the app. Show okay, the app. cool. If you, uh, I'll stop the share and you can take over. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, in the lines of what Mike was saying, uh, we were thinking of making something that's easy, that a business user could do, uh, but still fairly powerful, and that's fluid to write and to read. So we came up with, we came up with a schema to do it, and this schema is on our wiki page. So. The schema is basically divided our syntax in elements, we call them, and we have questions, answers, operators, types, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff here. I'll just go through a simple example we have here. And this, this is our current uh, uh, engine. And what we have here is a couple of views. So we can have, the, we can view everything in JSON mode. And we also have the text. That's where we create the, the form. So let's say we want to make another form, another question. So question has a type is the text. Then we run it. And as you can see, we have a new question here. So the way we thought of was uh, we don't really need to open and close a lot of brackets, which is usually the norm. And we have a, a way to make it and see it at the same time. It's still, there's still some bugs. It's still early, early stages, but it, it's, it's looking pretty good already. And we can also get something more advanced, which I would say this one. So basically we have a section which is this one, and we could divide our forms into sections. So every time we press next, we go to another section and we could implement some logic and some, some more advanced features. So say we want, to, we want to help a customer find something in our website. Uh, what we can do is we can have a form where he can say, uh, uh, welcome to the uh, back to bikes. Uh, I'm looking for maintenance courses. So we have a condition here that once maintenance course is clicked, this opens up and maybe it answers or not. If so, uh, yes, I need some more information. So you can ask your name here, we'll get an email. And that's a pretty simple example. And I won't go a lot of depth into it because there will be no time, but I think it shows that it's a fairly powerful tool 
and we could save a lot of time just by making a, a well-developed form and writing it, not only writing it, but reading it, it's also easy. So it would not be as scary for a non-technical user to do it. But if you want to add conditions or something more complex, uh, developers could also do it. And that's basically the, the syntax we have. So I'll pass it over to Mike again. All right. So yeah, there's benefits in this. I mean, you could hook this up to your GitHub repository such that the, the, the code here was, was saved to GitHub. Um, you could then squash your commits on a regular basis. You can even backtrack and do version history of, of your code on that. Yes. All right, so what, what we might do is um, go over to Tim and, and Min, who have done the, the, the drag and drop part of this. So they, they've got their own little show that they're going to lead you through. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me share my screen real quick. <clears throat> Oh, can you guys uh, see my screen? Yep. Yep. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks for having us. So my name is Ming Kuang Hong and uh, I team up with Tim and we created the drag and drop editors um, on top of the text editor for Back to Bytes. So a little bit about introductions, like Tio and Mai showed you guys earlier. This is a screenshot from the text editors. This is a form schema. And you basically follow the schema and you type in, you hit run. It renders the form on the right-hand side. And here is a JSON syntax, um, fair and simple. But the question is, um, for example, so like if you are a business, man and you haven't like learned all our schema syntax yet and you want to quickly in a minute uh, create a forms by drag and drop then we will jump in and we fill uh, the gap of that knowledge for you quickly so we can get you settled in just a minute we got inspired from uh, like mike mentioned earlier job form which is a powerful tool which you can create a form from scratch just by drag and dropping the elements and um, here is a screenshot of JotForm, just something very simple. Uh, you have a bunch of question types on the left-hand side, and you can drag it, for example, like full name, email, or address fields to the canvas, and it will render it on the canvas. We also follow that inspiration, and we have many question types similar to JotForm, such as short text, long text, email, and address. But that's when the similar stop. Now here is our early design. So me and team a couple of months ago, uh, we went to Figma, we brainstormed and we think that, okay, how do we want to design this? How do we want it to look to the customers, uh, to the users? And we came up with the left fields here. So left view is for questions, similar to job form, sure. But it also an in inspections. What I mean inspection is when you clicked on the question itself in the canvas, in the middle, all the uh, schema syntax will show up in the inspections. And on the right fields, you can um, manually tweak and modify the IDs of the questions or the values of the answers or your choice. The possibility is endless, and I will show you in just a minute right here. Uh, but before that, I'll pass on to my teammate team so we can talk to you about the design challenge. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so one of the design challenges we faced when starting the, starting the development process was in addressing the fact that we had to implement a set of field types with the view that there could be more in the future. So the question we had on our minds was, could we design the builder in a way such that the field types could be developed in isolation from the rest of the builder without having to really understand the internals of how the builder works? 
So in other words, let's design the field types so that they are basically plug-inable like Lego bricks. So the first step to identify is the list of responsibilities for the builder. And so we had to identify what was common to all the fields. And then the next step was to identify the responsibilities that were distinct for each field type so that this would help narrow the scope down to what each field needs to do. So for the builder, we identified that we needed to be able to add fields. We also needed to identify, uh, we also needed to be able to delete fields and move the position around in the form. Uh, as for the field, it needs to render its own view, um, be able to edit its labels such as the text field label and multiple choice options. And lastly, it needs to handle editing values that don't appear on the form, but are used in persisting to a database or customizing the form. So basically those behave similar to the HTML ID or value attribute. So what you're seeing on the screen there is basically the, the tree of components that we're rendering. So this is all done in React. So the hierarchy would somewhat mirror this kind of representation with a few details left out. So we have the parts component whose job is to render buttons that on click will generate new fields inside a canvas or the form area. The canvas manages all the field instances and renders them in the right order. And then when one field is selected, we can actually view or update its specific attributes inside the inspector. Um, the parts component needs to share state with the canvas to tell it what fields to render. And a selected field needs to share state with the inspector to tell it when to display attributes. So with all the state flowing around this render tree, how do we actually manage all this state? Uh, we could use context, but there's actually a couple problems with that. Every time a value gets updated in context, every co component under the provider re-renders. So if we had a single context, everything would basically re-render. So if you were to just highlight or select uh, a field, essentially everything in that tree would re-render. Another option would be we could split up the context into smaller contexts. So one for parts, one for every field type. The, there's actually a lot of boilerplate in doing that and it actually becomes a real challenge when we're dealing with a dynamic number of fields in the form. So what's the solution? Is there a better way to handle state? Well, yes, there is. There's a new library actually and it's called Recoil and it's done by the folks at Facebook. It's still in experimental stages. So I think currently uh, the latest version is 0.4.1. So definitely not ready for production deployment. So in a nutshell, the Recoil API behaves very similar to how local state is done in React, but with one major difference in that the state can be shared directly between components a concept called an atom. So an atom is a unit of state that can be subscribed to and updated. When it gets updated in one component, any other subscribed component gets re-rendered with the new value. And another concept is called an atom family and it's essentially a collection of atoms. So you can think of it as like an array whose elements or atoms can be accessed via function parameters. So in these code snippets here on the top right corner, you'll see an atom being declared and it's very simple to declare an atom. It's essentially an object with two keys. Uh, one is, uh, well, one is the key and then the other is the default. Um, the key is generally just a string to identify the name of the atom and it's normally used for persisting to a database. And then the default prop underneath is what their default value is. And in this case, it's just a number. 
So on the bottom two snippets, you'll see two very basic React components, React function components. And the use of the React recoil API is very simple. Instead of use state, you just pop in a recall in between. So it's just called use recall state. And the function parameter, instead of being a default, as you would normally use in use state, it's actually the atom itself. So you can consider the atom as sort of like a proxy. And whenever you, whenever you actually use this atom, it automatically gets updated in the other components that subscribe to it. So you can see there's a getter and a setter there for font size and set font size, which anyone familiar with React should um, be able to easily grow um, since it's so similar with use state. So with this concept of atoms, we not only reap the rendering benefits, but we can actually encapsulate each field state inside an atom and share it with any component that needs access to it. What this boils down to is a set of state transformations. So the field component is responsible for implementing a map data to atom function, which only happens if we're loading JSON data from the text editor that Mike and Theo showed. So updates to the field component are made to this atom. And then when the user is satisfied with the changes, the new sources generate from the atom and the changes are propagated back to the text editor. Okay, thanks, Tim. So now I will talk about why we um, come with the decision to choose drag and drop for our little project. <clears throat> um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we see that um, our project needs to fill the gaps so it helps people in the rush that they can create uh, a complete form from scratch in just a minute. And that's our aside to uh, research about the React drag and drop. Um, first, I use um, React drag and drop, which is very famous in the developer community, but I found it's a bit complex and probably not suitable for our project at that moment. And then I found another solution, which is um, beautiful DND, which we stick with since then. After um, many tutorials and try by myself, I uh, kind of figure out that beautiful DND basically can be summarized in four sentences, which we have first layer is the DND providers wrapped as the outer layers for the everything. And we come as a DND droppable, the second layers, which you provide an unique ID for the part you want to drop. And then the third layer is gonna be DND draggable, which you also need to provide a unique ID for whatever elements you wanna drag and drop. Um, and finally, you end with drag and drop context because when you drag and drop the element, you need that drag and drop context to maintain the orders of the element. And here's a screenshot of my first crack as um, drag and drop when uh, I create a short text question. Uh, it's not much, but it explains the concepts I just uh, mentioned earlier. Um, you have the providers, it's the outer layers, and then inside you have a draggable layers, which the key here is gonna be the question ID, and it's a unique ID. And inside I basically renders a list of question and I close it with a droppable layers and finally drag and drop context to maintain the orders of the element. Now, after that, uh, me and Teams, we met up, we brainstorm again, and we figure out how to integrate the drag and drop into the system, which already used Recoil, just as uh, Tim mentioned earlier. And Tim came up with a brilliant solutions. Uh, we gonna import the 
D and D, the drag and drop, beautiful drag and drop to our app, and then we got the modifiers to for suitable for our um, applications. We create a D and D providers component here, as you can see, and similarly, uh, we will create another component for droppable and another component for draggable. Inside, we modify the parts to integrate with Recall. So, uh, as Tim mentioned above, the builders gonna be the top leaders of our application, and each side is gonna have canvas parts and inspectors matching the left fields, the middle fields, and the right fields screenshot earlier. And here is the screenshot of the builders. You can see that the DND providers is the outer layers, and then it wrapped the builders inside. And inside the builders renders the parts, the canvas in the inspectors. And where do we drop the droppable and draggable? Sorry, there seems like a missing a slide here. Let me see what happened. Ah, here we go. Uh, no. Okay, sorry about that. So here is a slide of the canvas and here we have the droppable and the draggables. So we can drop and drag the questions and the choice or the answers of the question inside the canvas. We can switch our orders and everything. So that's the main engine. And here is the screenshot of the demo um, of our drag and drop editors is the pre-alpha, but um, based on the context, you pretty much can understand. Here's the questions being rendered at the canvas. It's a single choice question. And if you click on the question itself, um, it will show in the inspection part here, and you can change whatever the schema syntax in here, for example, ID or the values of the choice. And you can drag and drop the questions around the canvas, and you can also drag and drop the choice inside the question. The button here to change the orders of the choice, and the X button, of course, to delete the question. So that brings me to the end of our presentation. Oh, I mean, like me and team presentation. And I'll pass it to uh, Mike so I can continue our presentation. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, I think that was all. Theo, did we have something else to present or are we kind of done? Uh, yeah, I think we're done, basically. Does anyone have any questions or, you know, areas that we haven't covered in depth enough? I can, I, if you raise your hand, I can invite you to talk, I think. I presume I can see where you raise your hand. Can you share how the final drag and drop solution look like? Can you, have you got a, a, a demo you can run up either Tim or Min? Uh, yeah, I do. Let me just share my screen. Oh, yeah, we might check the impact chat. Impact chat, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, That's a good idea. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yep. So this is the text mode. Uh, editor, which Theo demoed. And what I've currently got is just two multiple choice question types because 
Um, that's the only type that we currently support. Um, so let's head on over to the drag and drop. And so as Min was describing earlier, we can actually drag these form elements around and we can also click to make them animate downwards and upwards. And that's through the power of that React Beautiful DMD. Um, and as you can see, once, a, <clears throat> once an element has been selected and highlighted in blue, you can actually edit the non-visible um, attributes. So in the canvas area, we only show the labels, but there are actually other parts of the syntax that aren't normally visible in the form. So things like the ID um, and the val, which you can edit in this right panel here. Um, so let's go ahead and add a new single type. Uh, we can ask any, any simple question like the capital of Australia. And we can give the options. And when we're happy with that, we can give an ID. And an ID is actually required for every question type. So we can just call this capital. So we've got three questions now, but in the text mode editor, we, we originally only had two. So let's go ahead and save this. And what that actually does is it will update the text mode with the new question. So if I go back to the single view, we should see that new question added at the bottom. And we don't actually see the new question added in the preview mode because we need to run the form. And so when we do that, the new question is updated. Um, I guess besides that, um, we can also delete question types. So X, bang, it goes away. And we can also uh, rearrange the, the nested uh, arm drag and droppable. So if I were to say, moved, he ordered third class gates lock to the last position and then save that. And go back to single. You can see it's it's been uh, rearranged there. I guess that's pretty much it. Um, we have been working on a mobile view for the drag and drop editor, but it works very similar to what you see there, but it's just more responsive. Yeah, and there were some unique challenges around, you know, the amount of real estate on the screen. And it, it makes the design quite different. I don't know if you want to show how you sort of approach that, Tim, with the way you mm -hmm. um, sort of displayed the widgets. Yeah, I'm going to have to dive into dev mode then to make it into responsive mode. So... Let me just pop this out so there's more screen real estate. So I guess one of the challenges with responsive mode was figuring out how to lay out in mobile because in desktop we had the left panel, the middle section and the right panel. So the left panel basically has to go as well as the right panel because there's just not enough uh, screen space. So what you see here is basically just the canvas being rendered. 
And so we've got all these form elements um, being shown with the addition of a floating action button at the bottom because we're using material UI as our um, styling framework. So if you click on the plus button, it actually pops up as a bottom sheet or a drawer, I should say. And in the drawer, that's where you actually add in new uh, elements. So if I click on single, we should get a new single element showing up at the bottom. And as for showing, inspecting the actual um, attributes, if you click on one of these items and then click on this triple dot icon, it again shows up as a drawer so that you can actually inspect the items by scrolling down a bit. And we actually have plans to make this drawer full screen so you can actually swipe it up to full screen and swipe it down to make it disappear. Um, I guess that's, that's okay. about it. You had an outline mode as well, didn't you? How do you get to that? Were you Sorry, just, the, if you wanted to reorder the questions, you had like a summary mode where it just- Oh, yeah. Effect. So one of the other challenges that we faced was in dragging these items around. So you can actually drag, um, you can actually move these using these buttons. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it from your screens, but it actually animates pretty poorly. And so, after realizing this, I decided that there's probably a better way to implement this reordering of items. So what I ended up doing was adding a nav bar at the top. So when you click on edit, it pulls up another screen and basically uh, shows a summarized version of each of these elements. So what you're seeing here are just the question labels and that would actually enable you to more easily drag and drop um, or reorder the items essentially. And with also the added benefit of being able to select multiple items and just delete them in one go, rather than actually having to find them and then delete them individually on this screen. I think that's pretty much all I have to say in regards to the, the demo. Cool. Um, I was just thinking there's a, there's a bunch of the um, Vasco guys here. I've, I've enabled you to talk, Radislav. Would you like to say, say anything about the, uh, what you've seen? Um, yeah, if you can hear me, that would be great. I hope it's fine. Yeah, we can hear you, yep. Yeah, so it's really great work. I'm actually surprised how, like, how much did you actually make? And not only because, like, it's completely open source and actually, like, nice to hear that. And it's always to see some cool open source stuff being created all there, but also because we also have a form builder that Damian just linked on the chat, and it looks basically the same <laughs> like the general ui uh, of it is basically the same like the the layout that on the left side we have the existing fields in the middle we have the canvas on the right side we have the uh, details or the properties of the of the field right it's basically the same and that's that's actually funny how how similar it is um so yeah so that's that's definitely one thing and i would like to know if there's anything literally anything in the uniforms that you would like to, I don't know, change, improve, yeah. adjust. Yeah. That's, okay. that's basically my question. That, that's a careful what, we, what you wish for moment, I think. Um, yes, the, there's, there's lots of things, I guess. There's constraints that you have because you've got different 
presentation layers. So I know that a lot of what you've done is, is constrained by those, that it's not supported in all platforms. I find that's a bit of a limitation. Um, oh, we lost the meeting. Oh no, it's still there, yep. You just stop presenting, yeah. Um, so yeah, look, I mean, it would be great to have some discussions around um, what we can do together is there's things that we need. I've kind of sat on top of, because because my approach is to say, well, look, we'll build the design in a space where we're not constrained by the implementation of it. And then there's a layer that sits below that, that then compiles it and transforms it into a way that, that uniforms will understand. So it's almost like that solves a lot of the problems by taking them away from uniforms and not asking uniforms to do it. However, having said that, there's probably a bunch of stuff that could be done in uniforms to make it better to, you know, look at more um, question display types or ways of doing things. So if you guys are open for some discussions, that would be great. And then we could kind of work out who end up who ends up doing the work, whether we, we can help or whether you guys are still contributing um, on, on a regular basis to it. Yeah, so like, I guess we can definitely have a talk about that. Most importantly about the things that you just said that are kind of limited in the uniforms because we also like encountered them while creating our form builder, right? We also yeah. saw that. And that's why, for example, we are, we are actually using uniforms. We are creating JSON schema as well. So we are basically doing more or less the same uh, baseline in here. But in our case, we actually developed the entire theme for the form builder. So it's like we developed, like we didn't use any of the existing uniform themes. You can use them, it will work. But for the builder itself, we actually developed another one just for the builder, right? Yeah. So that's how it went. But yeah, yeah definitely, we are definitely open for a discussion. And if you'd like to have one, then yeah, we'll just, I, I don't know, you can just mail me and then we can actually have a talk. Yeah, that, that would be great. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, and, and we came to a similar thing because I talked to Tim about can't you use the uniforms thing for this and he goes oh, it's kind of complicated and he ended up doing it like not, not so much his own way but a different way uh, and probably for similar reasons that you did that the, the sort of base, you know, the control over the widgets was quite different from just bringing up a standard form it had to be it had all, all those special controls needed to be there so the, the uniforms itself wasn't really enough for that i mean I, I and i'd certainly like to be able to take this you know like levels above like to go to do some really advanced my dream is to sort of have a really advanced form builder capability in a very simple fashion, you know, that you can do simple stuff and you can do complex stuff as well. And you can do different layouts and maybe themes. And, you know, I think if we've got sort of layers of, of libraries to do particular stuff, then, then it's all possible. Um, I've also got a workflow engine that, that I've built for a, a customer. Um, and I'd like to kind of tie the two together so you could actually put forms up and people could fill them in and then they could kick off a workflow and request, um, you know, basically you attach a form to a step in the workflow and then you could build a whole business around, you know, forms and, and workflow. And you, you know- like You won't believe, like, you wouldn't that. believe what else we did. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, we definitely have to talk about it because- <laughs> In fact, let me share something else because funnily enough, like obviously we've been doing the same thing in, in different countries. Because you're where in Poland, is it in um, Warsaw? Yeah, it's in Poland. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, it's in, in, in Warsaw, yeah. Yeah, okay. So if I share with you and then I'll show you this thing, which is, there's this, uh, I was going to say crazy, but he's not necessarily crazy. A guy called Michael Becker who's in, um, Berlin, I think, um, or Mainz. I, anyway, somewhere in Germany. And he has built a similar thing where he's basically got this whole complicated form builder stuff. And it's act actually mind boggling what he's built in it. And he's he's got a JSON schema behind it. Um, 
we we had a long deep dive with him because he's he was keen for us to sort of help and contribute to his project. Um, it looks amazing, and one of the possibilities was for us to adopt this, although we're not sure about it. It's it's quite complicated. It's it's really only sort of alpha. He says it's alpha quality because he doesn't want people to be jumping in. You know, he's still working on the um, on the capabilities of it, but he's got some impressive stuff there. Like it's even got undo capability. So when you're editing the values on the form, you can actually undo and you can backtrack it. And then he's built some state management stuff that was sort of was superior to, you know, the Redux stuff didn't do what he wanted. So he's built his own state management thing. He's actually engineered a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I said to him, oh, you're about six months ahead of us. And he goes, oh, try four years. <laughs> and um, after the deep dive, I can believe that because there's an awful lot of stuff in there. Um, he has the same problem with, with extending the schema, you know, that trying to describe the UI inside the JSON schema and still be compliant to the standard is, is just about impossible. I mean, one of the things I did consider was to just fork a schema and say, look, I don't care. I'm going to create my own UI extensions and I'm going to break the standard schema, but I don't care. <laughs> but I didn't get to that point. But that might still be an option. Yeah, so like we are using JSON schema for the validation part, but we are not using it for the UI part. So we have like a separate UI schema, separate layout schema, and then we have the data schema. And then we use all three of them to actually render the form itself. So that's you can try it out. Like in the link that Damien just sent, you can actually see the demo and you can actually click through it and you can actually check it out later. All right, so in, in your form builder, you've, you've ended up with three schemas? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. That's interesting. I'd, I'd love to be able to dig inside that. I don't know if you guys are able to share under non-disclosure or what have you. Let's talk about it. I think yeah. it's possible. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're not in the business of stealing software. So, um, but obviously you, you may have some commercial sensitivities, but there's, there's lots and lots to talk about. So um, yeah, it would be great to, uh, to have some more discussions about it. Um, all right, any other questions from the floor? I know we've kind of hogged the thing, hogged the question time. Anyone else got questions, comments? I think we're about, we've got like two minutes left, so. I'd like to say a big thanks to my team. They've done an amazing job, like, you know, collect a bunch of random students and give them an assignment. It, it's way exceeded what I imagined we would achieve. Um, Tim has, has done an amazing job in looking into recoil and, and structuring the drag and drop stuff really well. Min has come up to speed, you know, he's, he's definitely in the rookie category, but he, like he, he said himself tonight, I used to be a rookie. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's happy about his own strengths. And, and Theo has been really good adding another perspective, getting me to tease stuff out. And I know I kind of butted heads with him a bit. He put up with that and he, he was persistent with me and we, we've ended up with a, a better result. His documentation has been good. He's been, meandering off into other aspects of the back to bikes. Um, we've got a, quite a few modules that we've built and things that we use in the workshop. So he's been helping with that as well. So, you know, very happy with the way things have, have developed. And, you know, I, I guess it's a bit like the whole back to bikes workshop that it's, it's become more than just me. Like when I started out, it was just me pushing and telling everybody. And then all of a sudden the, the energy comes up and it's like, okay, they're doing stuff and I'm just kind of going along for the ride, which is, which is very nice. <laughs> Looks like there were a couple of questions in the Meteor Impact chat. So one of them is how do you embed slash render the forms for the end users, the ones that would fill the data? Um, yeah, good question. We haven't come to that yet. I mean, there's, 
I envisaged that we would have some kind of um, code snippet that, that we would give to people so that they could put it in their WordPress site, for example, as a, as a short code. Um, obviously, iframes are an option and a lot of those things tend to use that stuff. So, and we'll build a like a runtime engine, which we don't have yet. And really that's just one slice of that little thing, like all of that machinery around it for editing isn't needed for the, the runtime. So that's kind of a, a relatively easy thing to do. Any more? Um, there was, what are your plans for the next steps with this tool? Yeah, well, the runtime would be um, a good step, um, a data repository, such that you could then look at the, the data from the forms, um, hook them up into um, you know, web hooks or something so that they could actually land in, in another system, um, send an email that, I mean, the send email is kind of easy, integrate with, and I guess the question is, how far do you go with integration? Do you just set yourself up with one of the integration systems so that you can, uh, like Zapier, for example, you have a, some hooks there and you say, right, that's done. Uh, or you provide some APIs. I'm not really sure what the best way to proceed in that department is. All right, well, we're right on nine o'clock. Is there another meeting straight after this one? No, it looks like, is that it for tonight? Or is there more? One a.m. is the next one, or is that? Um, I think that's it. That's it. I think. I think we had a couple of speakers drop out, but um, storyteller was. Um, let me just bring him in. Where is he? Jan, have you got plans for anything more? The next one is at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. I can't see it on my list, or am I looking at the wrong day? Freelance Marketplace with PTO. Yeah. OK. Well, there was supposed to be something, a uh, meter community survey results at, at nine o'clock. So maybe that started already. All right. Well, look, I guess we'll, uh, we'll call that one to a, a close. Uh, well done. Well done. Guys, presentation. I think that uh, that went down very well. There's a strong interest there. What do you think, Andrew? How'd that go? You're on mute at the moment. It went well. Um... Really great to see um, the improvements you've made to the um, drag and drop editor, especially the mobile view. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good, isn't it? I like the way that's, uh, that's landed. Does that mean you're coming back to join us, Andrew? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. It, um, work's been really busy lately. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around, so I'm just exhausted by the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, it's hard work, isn't it? A new job's always yeah, and with a lot of learning. Meant to be like an update release in the next week, but um, there's been some bugs, so everyone's been kind of hectic yeah. trying to fix everything. Yeah. So how are you enjoying it? Is it good? Yeah, it's been good. Learning a lot. Um, yeah. Um, do miss React and um, just all the nice 
media stuff sometimes. Oh uh, yeah, it's kind of just work. But yeah. So what are you what are you working in? Um, working in Splunk, which is like a data um, yeah. platform that you can do. Um, you can create apps that um, run on like. It technically uses like an XML to set it up if you like use the drag and drop editor, but you can inject JavaScript, CSS, and HTML in. Yeah. Um, so you can basically do like a custom app um, within it. Um, but yeah, working with vanilla JS, um, yeah. at least for now, there's like some way you can use React within it, but probably a bit too far into using vanilla to really. <laughs> Yeah, it sometimes to react. it gets a bit of a stretch sometimes, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's um, let's call it to a close. Thanks, guys. Thanks, audience. Well done, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank okay, Thank see ya. See you guys. Bye.